All right, we're almost ready, guys. I think we're live. All right, we're back on. Welcome back to another video. It's Mike Muntzel here. Thanks so much for tuning into this live stream. Sorry for the small delay getting started. My daughter's helping me out here and there's a trouble with the autofocus, but super excited that you're here, whether you're here live guys or you're watching the replay. Today, we're gonna to talk about autophagy. This is a biochemical process that many of you are already familiar with, but I wanna give a little bit of insights and context in, the, in regards to the ketogenic diet and also exercise. I think, you know, we talk about autophagy and mitoautophagy, microautophagy, chaperone mediated autophagy, uh, and today we're gonna to focus on macro autophagy. And that's the main mechanism through which exercise and a ketogenic diet and nutrient deprivation, if you will, that would be achieved through time restricted feeding intermittent fasting and or exercise and so forth, uh, the macro autophagy is what's going to be kind of the, the main uh, form or mode, if you will, modality of, of autophagy that, that's pertinent to you. So that's where we're going. I do like to always check into the feed very quickly just to make sure that I'm like here and on and you all can see me because I'm not like pre-recording this. We are doing this live. Um, so just give me one quick second, and I, I apologize if you watch the replay. All right, we got quite a few of you on, which is cool. And I'm there, I look very orange, but uh, what do you do? Um, so friends, thanks so much for being here. I look reasonably in focus, which is hard to do when you're self-shooting. So, you know, why talk about this on a Wednesday? And what I've realized is if we we create stories and we, we kind of learn through stories, it may stick with you a little bit better. Um, so on Wednesdays, you know, my daughter gets out of school early. She's coloring right below here and she gets out at like one o'clock. So we have to figure out stuff to do after school. And so I took her on a bike ride in our neighborhood and I saw all the garbage cans out because the garbage men in the recycle, or I don't think there's any garbage women. There could be. I think it's mostly men picking up the recycle bins and the trash. I was like, that's so interesting. That's basically what autophagy is. It's both our our, our intracellular, really, autophagy is going on, uh, macroautophagy, that is, that we're speaking about today, is occurring in the cytosol of the cell. So you have your cell and you have your different cellular components, okay? And so, you know, on Wednesdays, what we do, or every day, you guys probably do this too, guys and gals, wherever you are in the world, what you do is you take your trash from your kitchen and you recycle and you bring it out to your driveway, and then when the trash day comes, you bring your big trash can out from, you know, that's filled up with all the stuff, the recycling, things are thrown away, your waste, you put it on the street and that gets cleaned up. That's essentially autophagy uh, in a nutshell, okay? Now this is going on in your muscle cell, your liver cell, your immune system, this is going on in your brain, or I should say it should be going on in those different tissues. But in various disease states, um, you know, everything ranging from autoimmunity, from cancer, from cachexia, you know, from, uh, you know, insulin resistance, obesity, there's dysfunctional autophagy within fat cells that's linked with obesity and obesity like uh, fat cell inflammation. So all these different things, right? So dysfunctional autophagy, actually in animal models, when they, when they splice out the so-called autophagy genes, which if you ever read the research, it's the capital A ATG, the ATG genes, there's about 18 specific autophagy genes and what I haven't yet dove into, and I'm hoping to explore in a new book that I'm working on, is the single nucleotide polymorphisms, the so-called SNPs, in autophagy genes. And I think maybe some people are more predisposed to sluggish autophagy pathways. They, those individuals might need to fast more often, more frequently, or and or exercise more often, and potentially might have issues with ketosis. Again, this is just speculation. I'm diving into the primary research now, but... Um, Autophagy, based upon a new animal model study that I'll highlight right here, is necessary is a necessary event. Where is it? Uh, you guys are gonna dig this one, guys and gals. You're gonna dig this. So it's a uh, right here. So autophagy is kind of a necessary biochemical event to stimulate hepatic and renal renal ketogenesis. So that means syn uh, ketone synthesis occurs within the liver and the kidneys, and it seems that on a biochemical level, at least in animal models at this point that autophagy is needed to stimulate ketogenesis uh, in these different tissues. And when autophagy is blocked by like affecting those so-called ATG genes, those are the autophagy genes, that these animals don't make ketones. So I think it's, it's really interesting to sort of think about. So again, just wanted to kind of throw that out there. That's one of the things that, you know, and I created this silly title of this video, autophagy and keto or like peas and carrots, right? And I, I think 
they really are like peas and carrots, as Forrest Gump said. Nez, what do you think of Forrest Gump? Remember, she's, I know it's an old movie with Tom Hanks. You got to check it out, guys. So going back to the analogy, um, so what creates uh, the, the basically your cells to kind of get rid of the trash and or recycle some of its components? What are the steps needed to create that? And, and, and first of all, let me pause and preface where we're going with this. Because so many of you have asked me, you've asked other practitioners, I get direct messages all the time, I would say at least several times a day about, hey Mike, what breaks a fast? Is it okay to have coffee? Is it okay to have MCT oil? Is it okay to have branch chain amino acids? Is it okay to exercise on my fast? What should, how should I break my fast? These are all amazing questions. And I infer, based upon the question and the people that are asking me this, I infer that people are asking these questions because they're actually really concerned about uh, and hopefully my audio is good. Yeah, hopefully it's not any echoey. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I adjusted one thing and I'm thinking that I forgot, but I'll check the feed in a second. Um, people are asking me these questions because what they're, they're, they're trying to figure out is they're trying to fast and they're trying to kind of work around the fast so that it fits their lifestyle and their diet and you know cravings and things like that, but not necessar necessarily mitigate the potential health benefits garnered from the fast, right? And so people... You know, we'll ask, will coffee kick me out of a fast? I don't think so. I think really if we look at the mechanisms, you know, if we look at the cellular signaling components that kind of affect autophagy and autophagy signaling, it really kind of uh, starts with what, let's, let's talk about nutrition, then we'll talk about exercise separately because the signals are similar, but they're slightly different in exercise context and nutritional context. But long story short, in the nutritional context, when individuals have a glucose restriction and lack of growth signal stimulation, so it'll be lack of mTOR stimulation, that triggers autophagy. And so, you know, free fatty acids floating around from the adipocytes releasing their own stored adipose tissue, that's not going to kick you out of ketosis. So I think a small, or I'm sorry, out of ketosis, autophagy. So I think a small amount of, you know, a little bit of fat, maybe a very small amount of MCT oil would not necessarily kick you out of a fast or would not necessarily, um, you know, ameliorate the health benefits that you want, okay? Um, but what would affect and possibly slow down autophagy would be potentially any insulin signaling. And so this is, again, we don't have a lot of human clinical studies um, at this point that I know there's, there's two exercise interventions where they tracked autophagy genes, so-called ATG genes and, and other proteins associated with autophagy signaling in overweight women and have shown that exercise in conjunction with a real food diet does increase autophagy stimulation and so forth. But we don't have hu real good data in humans to say, well, if you have this much butter or if you have this much meat or if you have bone broth or if you have chicken or you have whatever, that that will or won't or will inhibit or you know uh, augment or enhance autophagy. We don't yet know that. So we have to kind of triangulate a little bit. And, and this is where the haters, Lane Norton and stuff is going to say, dude, you're just bro sciencing up over here. I'm not bro sciencing up but because we don't yet know all these mechanisms in humans because, I, you know, I guess, I, I don't know why. I think maybe researchers are looking at this. We do now know the mRNA transcripts that are increased when autophagy is stimulated. But it seems like one way that you can inhibit autophagy for sure is to have glucose or to have insulin being stimulated, okay? Um, that would be in a fasting uh, context. And so this was, uh, this was one of those papers that, that I wanted to kind of share with you uh, on that. All right, so let's get rid of that. Let me just check into the feed. And I know you guys watching the replay get a little bit annoyed when I do this. So we're on, we're here, sound is perfect. Okay, good. I always worry about the sound. Because for those of you that have been with us on this channel for a while, you know that we've had a fair amount of glitches with these live streams over the years when it comes to sound. It only took me two years, but I finally figured it out, hopefully. Uh, anyway, all right. So what will or what won't kick you out of the fast? Okay, let's talk about coffee first. This is a question people ask all the time. Will black coffee kick me out of the fast? Will black coffee blunt autophagy? Uh, Inez, please stop that. Stop. So um, my, she's knocking plants over and stuff like that. Uh, so this is an important question. I get this all the time. I know you're probably wondering yourself right now. Well, again, I, I, I don't have three-dimensional glasses where I can see autophagy genes being turned on or turned off when you're fasting. 
But what I do know based upon the growth factors, the nutritional factors that lead to uh, the metabolic cascades that stimulate autophagy, it doesn't seem probable that black coffee would negatively influence autophagy. Now, why would I say that? Well, because the, the, the growth factors, the metabolic stressors, the metabolic signals that, that inhibit autophagy um, are insulin and glucose and growth type factors. So mTOR stimulation, we're going to talk about exercise in a minute, so don't be so scared of mTOR stimulation. It's really mTOR stimulation mediated through the so-called AKT pathway. The I think it's called serine threonine phosphokinase pathway, um, which is kind of uh, an insulin-mediated pathway. So Insulin and glucose stimulation, protein stimulation, those are factors that would potentially kick you out or that would not kick you out of a fast, but that would maybe decrease the flux or the velocity, if you will, of autophagy, okay? And again, we don't have randomized human placebo-controlled trials here. We're talking about animal model studies, so keep that in mind. So black coffee, what it's actually going to do is it's going to enhance fat tissue release of stored triglycerides and create more free fatty acids. I think if anything, that would enhance autophagy. That would enhance ketogenesis. And again, these are parallel synergistic pathways that would enhance the so-called AMPK pathway. Okay, so let's just put it like this. So autophagy is kind of the end goal right here. And there's all these different targets above, okay? We have AMPK, we have PGC1-alpha. They kind of synergize on the so-called fox head box protein network, FOXO, FOXO3 is one of them. And when that gets stimulated, that triggers the, the nucleus within your cell to then make these autophagy proteins, okay? So exercise, time-restricted feeding, fasting, glucose restriction, carbohydrate restriction, um, growth factor restriction, so uh, glucose deprivation, and not having insulin surges, those are all gonna stimulate this nuclear receptor that's gonna then kick off these autophagy proteins. And again, it's like the analogy that I started this conversation with, taking trash out of your house, taking the recycling, putting it into the big trash cans, taking it out to the streets so the garbage people can pick up the recycling, recycle the boxes and things from Amazon, the order, cardboard and so forth, paper, and then take out the trash, the waste, the things that you're not gonna use in your home or in this analogy within the cell. And we can see when cells lose that ability to kick on this, you know, basically this recycling and waste system, they become dysfunctional. And there's aggregate proteins, beta amyloid protein is one that we know in the brain that, that is associated and may contribute to the pathology and decline in neural functioning. Uh, we know, for example, in various tissues I talked about, the, the adipocytes, uh, we know in the liver, the immune system. Now, Let's just talk about the, not all autophagy is good, nor is it all bad, but it's not something that you totally want upregulated all the time. For example, um, there is some connections between this pro-inflammatory pathway called nuclear factor kappa beta. Many of you are familiar with this. So if you have intestinal permeability, if you have exposure to mold, if you have exposure to Lyme, even if you bump your shoulder or something along those lines, nuclear factor kappa beta is going to be released. This is the main kind of switch that turns on pro-inflammatory signaling pathways within the body, okay? And likewise, taking fish oil, taking curcumin, taking vitamin D, taking probiotics, all these things downregulate NF-kappa B. But it seems that NF-kappa B and autophagy are parallel pathways. So um, cancer cells have figured out ways to adapt and evolve to um, influence their own autophagy signaling, which can then, guess what, affect uh, the, the growth and metastasis and things like that. So um, keep that in mind. So that's kind of the, the, the there's a U-shaped curve here. Some is good. More is not always better. So, so you want to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, but let's talk about autophagy and exercise. This is what's really interesting. And so we know that People that exercise, sometimes they look younger visibly. They might have better skin. They might have reduced incidence of various diseases. They might have better blood sugar regulation, better insulin glucose tolerance, more metabolic flexibility. And it, what's interesting is just the adaptations that occur from exercise are autophagy mediated. Do you need to leave, Nancy? Go ahead. So she's leaving. Can you shut the door, please, too? Less, less background noise but I liked having a little buggy here. All right, so exercise is one way to stimulate autophagy. And this is why, you know, it's interesting to think about, right? You have this triad where we have your diet, 
We have your feeding windows, fasting windows, and exercise. Obviously, there's sleep and there's meaning, purpose, relationships, you know, all the environmental toxins and all these things, right? But I think it's interesting that like we can get into ketosis by just changing our diet. We can get into ketosis and, and, and mimic the so-called fasting mimicking metabolism, if you will, through just exercise, right? So we know that people that are metabolically flexible, even though they don't aren't low carb per se, they, their body can kick up ketones, especially in the post-workout window. They have great insulin signaling, glucose tolerance, and so forth, right? And then we also have the time-restricted feeding or fasting window element. So, so we have this triad, right? And so we can tweak this and utilize it how we want. And I think it's important to understand this. And so I think all of us listening, kind of the take-home message here is not so much, will coffee kick me out of the fast? Will a little butter kick me out of the fast? Whatever, just understand that anytime you're kind of having a glucose or insulin or protein surge, that is going to send the signals to downregulate autophagy. Having tea, having coffee, having electrolytes, maybe a small amount of MCT oil or a little bit of an exogenous ketone if you really think you need it for the appetite, you know, suppression and things like that, probably not that big of a deal but to, in terms of affecting autophagy. But again, we have exercise and exercise, part of the weight, and I'll, let me share with you one of the, the clinical studies here, uh, which is right here. All right, it, I would encourage you to, to read the study. And by the way, our Patreon members, you get access to the transcript of these videos and all the links to the studies and more that we talk about. So just go to highintensityhealth.com forward slash Patreon or click the link below. So I send those out about 24 hours after we do these live streams and so forth. So if you're interested in like diving deeper, check it out if you'd like. However, interesting that triad. So exercise is another tool to stimulate autophagy. And What's interesting is is people that are exercisers and keto, I've found generally, myself, many other friends in the space, doing prolonged fast for them is hard. Um, you know, going over 36 hours can be pretty challenging. And you might think, well, that's so easy. The human body should be able to do that. And you're probably like, yeah, right. But what if autophagy is already kicked up? What if these growth signaling pathways are already being suppressed in the post-workout window because they're being utilized, right, to recover from exercise? So anyway, it's interesting to think about that, like, maybe if you're getting your exercise in on a regular, consistent basis, you're eating a low-carb, high-fat, healthy, whole food-derived diet, and, and you're doing your exercise, maybe you don't need to fast as much or often. You can maybe compress your feeding window to 12, 16 hours a day and still get many of the benefits that maybe inactive people might only get after, say, 24 hours of fasting. So I think it's it's neat because, you know, fasting, although it's it's really great, there's a lot of health benefits to it. I fast every single Monday for 24 hours. I do a quarterly, you know, 36-hour uh, to 48-hour fast um, every fiscal quarter. I think it's great to really go longer than just the 24 to 36 hours that I try to do every week. Um, but also, when you're exercising regularly, you're you're ramping up that autophagy pathway. So just think about it. When you're getting stronger on your deadlift or your squat or your pull-ups or your bench presses, military presses, if you, any of those major lifts, when you're getting stronger or your muscles are growing, guess what's working? Autophagy. The adaptations that occur within the, the, the myocytes and, and skeletal muscle is autophagy-mediated, guys. So it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty neat. I don't know about you, uh, but my two cents. And uh, friends, these live videos are sponsored by our very own Myoscience Nutrition. One of the tools that we've talked about before is berberine hydrochloride. And so everything we've talked about up to now are, is a summary of research. And of course, nutritional supplements and the things that I'm talking about uh, cannot cure, prevent, or treat, or diagnose any disease. Uh, but we do know that blood sugar uh, health can be improved with berberine. Berberine hydrochloride is one of the most researched natural compounds when it comes to supporting blood sugar health. So we do have our berberine plus hydro, uh, ber it's a, the form of berberine is berberine hydrochloride with alpha lipoic acid. So these are synergistic pathways. Links are below here. We have our myoscience storefront over on Amazon, and you can also go to myoscience.com. That's myoscience with an X, M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Be sure to use the promo code HIH to save 20% off your next order. And again, I found personally fasting and taking berberine really has an impact on blood sugar regulation and blood sugar health. So keep that in mind. 
Obviously, you don't need any supplements to improve your health, but supplements can help to supplement your healthy diet and lifestyle. So I wanna get to some of your questions. I'm sure you have a lot of questions here, Uh, but again, just to recap and summarize, uh, when it comes to kicking or or kind of slowing down autophagy when you're fasting, you don't wanna have sugar, you don't have too much protein, and what you really want is glucose restriction, insulin restriction, okay? Uh, What about amino acids? What about mTOR inhibition? You know, I don't recommend, if you're fasting for autophagy, I don't recommend supplementing with BCAAs during the fast. I recommend supplementing BCAAs before exercise and after exercise. That's when actually, according to recent published research, taking branched-chain amino acids is gonna give you the best benefit and enhance exercise recovery and so forth is around exercise. Now, I know Gabrielle Lyon and other people have talked about you need this muscle protein stimulus all the time and so forth, but again, according to the research, when it comes to taking branched-chain amino acids, BCAs, particularly getting that bolus of leucine, and we do offer uh, clinically studied branched-chain amino acids over at Myoscience, but you know, the, the leucine, uh, the, the bolus of that stimulates the muscle protein synthesis and the mTOR, and studies show that around exercise is when that's most efficacious. So keep that in mind. Having a little caffeine, having black coffee, having green tea, these things are not going to necessarily impair autophagy, if anything, because they will enhance the fat cell lipolysis of stored lipids. What that basically means, lipolysis, snipping stored fat, and taking it out and freeing it from the fat cell, putting it in the bloodstream, if anything, that will enhance autophagy. Kind of the other big take home from this conversation is that ketosis may be necessary, autophagy may be needed to enhance ketogenesis and ketosis. So keep that in mind. Uh, Again, this is an animal model study that I shared with you earlier. Interesting to think about. So Let's dive into some questions, and uh, just because we're talking about science here, and you probably want something more visually interesting to look at, I'm going to leave this diagram right here. All right. So thanks for being here, guys. It's so fun, and gals, so fun to uh, connect with you. Uh, It's always good that you're here. All right. We got quite a few of you on, which is super, super awesome. And also, if you don't, if we're not yet connected on Instagram, yeah, you can find me over at metabolic underscore Mike on Instagram. The videos and images like you're seeing uh, right here, I share this type of stuff all the time on Instagram. So if you like to nerd out on science and so forth, we can do that. Um, oh, dude. So uh, Spinol 1997 is sitting in their sauna right now. Bam! I love that. So uh, let's talk about the sauna and heat stress. Uh, I think this is interesting. I think um, cold stress and heat stress can affect autophagy signaling. Again, we don't yet have human placebo-controlled trials on that, but I would imagine that due to the fact that it is a, a mild stressor, I need to look at the mechanisms of heat, pro- heat shock protein activation and the so-called uh, autophagy genes, the so-called ATG genes. I'm sure there's some crosstalk coalescence there, but um, you know, from what I've read, it's more metabolic and nutrient stimulation. So again, the AMPK, the PGC1-alpha affecting that FOXO3 protein and that, that, that kind of a protein network then trips up or kind of kickstarts, if you will, the so-called autophagy genes. And that's what stimulates and makes proteins that kind of affect the the, the phagosome the, and the, the autophagophore. It's really kind of funny, the, the, uh, the vernacular, the jargon associated with autophagy. Are, there's some interesting words in there. Um, Eric says, don't give up. Fasting plus exercise gets easier the more often you do it. Eric, you are on this. So guys, I'm starting something that maybe you can hopefully join me on. It's called Metabolic Monday. Every Monday, we're gonna fast the entire day, okay? So what we do is basically we cut off dinner on Sunday by 7 p.m., whatever your time zone is, and you don't eat again. If you wanna, if you wanna do a 36-hour fast on Monday, that's fine, but we're gonna just fast for a, at least 24 hours every single Monday for the rest of 2019. I would love to have you on board. If you do, please use the hashtag Metabolic Monday on Monday when you fast. Now, what's the rationale and reasoning behind this? Well, Mondays are the first day of the week, and we know that progress begets more progress. Momentum begets more momentum. If you spend your Monday fiddling around in your email, um, unproductive, yeah, you're on social media, things like that, you're probably going to feel like crap about the rest of your week. But if you're fasting, you don't have to worry about food on new Monday. You can hit a good workout and feel great about it. And so that's, I, I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I've, I've, I've even made some videos on a, on a Monday and called it Metabolic Monday. I think you guys recognize that. 
but I've been doing this for the past couple of Mondays and I felt amazing. The amount of, I don't have to, you don't have to think about food uh, on a Monday. Like how great you can get so much more. I got so much more done from a personal development, audiobooks, b- thing, articles, just organizing taxes, finances, business, you know, content creation for this channel and for you. And it was amazing. So I want you and I want to encourage you to join us on Monday. So we're cutting off the feeding window Sunday, 7 p.m. Why 7 p.m.? Because we want you to get to bed early and having a big full stomach full of food will affect your deep sleep. And that will, you know, if you if you fast from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and you most people get up around 7 or before and go to work, you're definitely going to be going to work in a ketogenic state. And, uh, you know, all the, the different A and different neurotransmitters that are upregulated to help humans become smarter when uh, n- nutrient deprivation uh, is kicked in will help you probably be more productive in your work. So if you're a business owner, if you're a stay-at-home mom, whatever you do, uh, you will have a better day, most likely. All right. So that's a small little sidestep. Uh, wow. We have uh, a lot of questions here. So uh, Starker Hominoid says, um, don't do BCAs during the fast. Yeah, uh, so that's a good, good point. So let me just drop in um, this visualization, this visualization, this picture, this image uh, of what I was trying to share with you guys. Well, actually, it's the thumbnail of this video. And it actually shows, it, it illustrates quite eloquently what we're talking about here in regards to the... Um, uh, in regards to the, the various nutrient factors and so forth that are um, upregulated, okay? And so if you look there, mTOR, um, you know, mTOR is a, a growth factor, right? So, so autophagy is more catabolic, mTOR is more growth. And mTOR uh, does inhibit, mTOR signaling does inhibit autophagy. So just keep that in mind. So having branched-chain amino acids during a fast, if you're a paid athlete, a paid bodybuilder and you're really worried about maybe losing skeletal muscle mass and even that's probably unlikely but if that is your scenario i understand it's your business it's your job um, maybe you want to take branch chain amino acids uh during your fast but for most people that are trying to just build a little muscle burn fat you don't need to worry so much about it okay um so great great uh, question there um so Johnny says, I tried a three-day fast, was so grumpy. Yeah, totally get it, totally understand. Um, I find sleep after 36 hours becomes a challenge. That's just me personally. Look, I, I, I commend so many people. I have friends that, that do these five-day fasts. I think they're it's amazing, right, if you can do that. Um, but that's it's, it's tough, right? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think uh, – I, I personally think that being a little bit more consistent with shorter fast, 24, 36 hours, more regular about that, including exercise, is going to be better long term. Um, so that's just kind of my my personal perspective. Could be wrong on that. I'm closing windows here and leave. Come on, Facebook. I want to get you out of there. All right. Um, so someone here says, I hear autophagy and mTOR are triggered by exercise, but opposites. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, great point. Yeah, so so interesting. There is some kind of overlap, though. If you look at, and I think this speaks to the tissue specificity of autophagy. Is autophagy signaling within the muscle tissue the same within the brain? Maybe, maybe not. Right. We know that different things like AMPK in the brain and specifically the hippocampus or sorry the hypothalamus affects appetite differently than in the muscle tissue. We know that acetylcholine stimulation or signaling within the heart has different effects on excitotox, excitatory stimulation versus it in the brain, right? So I think what we're going to probably see is that there's tissue-specific autophagy signaling, and the skeletal muscle may not respond in the, to the same signals, for example, mTOR may be stimulatory of autophagy within the skeletal muscle, but may downregulate autophagy within the brain. And again, so this is something that probably will be explored further, but I, I, it makes sense that there's, there's tissue specificity in autophagy triggers. But what we know across the board is starvation, nutrient deprivation, glucose deprivation, insulin deprivation are global kind of stimulators of autophagy in a myriad of different cell and tissue types. But it seems that maybe um, stimulation of muscle tissue via exercise may affect autophagy signaling, 
possibly through mTOR, which sounds kind of counterintuitive to what we just talked about. But again, this is just the studies that are coming out in humans uh, and the kind of the mechanisms that are being elucidated in the animal model study. So just keep that in mind. Uh, again, this tissue specificity, keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, so, but great question there. This was from Bum Itoid, I think. I'm Hopefully I'm pronouncing your YouTube deal right. Um, so let's see here. Uh, Gary says he's late to the call. This is one of the best channels on YouTube. Dude, very much appreciate those kind words. If you guys do like this YouTube channel, one way that you can kind of support us in a free way is go over to iTunes and just leave a little feedback. It's the same handle, high intensity health in iTunes. iTunes, unlike YouTube, doesn't, uh, you can subscribe obviously to the audio version of this YouTube channel in iTunes, but they're review based. So I'm super grateful if you can leave that. I re read all those. Uh, so Steph says, what do you, this is, I'm so glad. So, so Steph Kazar. Kazaza, hopefully I'm not botching your last name, but Steph has asked a brilliant question. What do you break your fast with? And this, I, this is something I wanted to address and, and I didn't even think that we would get to. Okay. Okay. So bear with me here. This is going to sound a little bit crazy, but when you've been intermittent fasting or prolonged fasting, at least on your muscle tissue, you get mildly insulin resistant. You're, now you're going, hold up, Mike, like, come on. I heard fasting is great for diabetes. I heard it's great for weight loss. How can you become insulin resistant from fasting? And research has actually shown that beta hydroxybutyrate, the main ketone body, guys, guess what? On a cellular level, when it's in high levels, it induces insulin resistance in muscle tissue. Again, it's, this doesn't mean that beta hydroxybutyrate is bad. It just means that it's maybe, because the muscles can be flexible. It's forcing the muscles to utilize more fat for fuel, which is a good thing for fat loss. And it's freeing up glucose for the obl obligate uh, cells, like the red blood cells, like the retina, various neurons, are obligate glucose utilizers. They can't utilize ketones or fatty acids. So this is a great question going back from Steph. And she says, what should I eat after I've been fasting? Okay, remember, so that your muscles, because of the high levels of ketones, might be mildly insulin resistant. So basically, you want to break your fast with protein and fat, okay? I think that's important to keep in mind. And it's also important to understand the intermittent fasting studies versus uh, continuous energy restriction studies, that is like low calorie versus intermittent fasting, have shown that on refeed days, that would be on non-fasting days, people that do alternate day fasting or intermittent fasting tend to overeat. So you want to keep that in mind you're probably gonna naturally want to overeat. You wanna make sure to break your fast with quality protein. So this can be plant-based protein, this can be animal flesh, whatever your thing is, it's, that's not my prerogative, it's whatever floats your boat and whatever you know you can tolerate and digest. Um, so like I personally, when I break my fast, I'll have a little bit of bone broth or meat. We cook a lot of meat and, and bone broth and all that, and kind of can, hate to use this analogy, but kill two birds with one stone using the crock pot because after you cook your bone in meats, you can take it out and get the broth and, and you know get the great growth factors and collagen peptides and all that um, from the broth. And so that's what I generally will break a fast with or eggs. Those are great too. Avocado. Uh, I, we make a lot of nut milks and nut breads. They're keto friendly, obviously, uh, around here. So th those are the few things that I recommend that you break your fast with. But this that's just such a brilliant question. So here's what you don't want to break your fast with is carbohydrates because your body, although you're in a low glucose state, your muscle tissue is mildly ins insulin resistant due to the fast, again, to kind of help the red blood cells and the uh, obligatory cells that are, are rely upon glucose for fuel, you want to give, you know, that's kind of one of the adaptive responses that occurs metabolically during a fasted state. And so you, you, um, you don't want to have carbs in the, in the post fast window. Sounds counterintuitive. I know maybe, but, uh, kind of makes sense. And again, so this is why like fasting and autophagy and keto are like peas and carrots, right? They're, they're like, bread and butter, They're like peanut butter and jelly. Uh, they really lend well together. So uh, let me just see here. What else we got? What else we got? Um, thanks for being here, guys. I'm going to get to a few more questions and then we're going to have, have dinner um, with the fam. Eating with family is really important, friends. Uh, so what else? Um, so we got JG Lee says, uh, perhaps you're in ketosis. More research will come out as the future is autophagy. Yeah. So I think, um, 
I think more research will come out about kind of the connections and the, you know, maybe if your ketone levels are X, then that means there's this degree or not of autophagy signaling. Uh, really good, really good questions there. Um, Eric Williams says, does dry fasting help lose skin from losing a lot of weight? Yeah. So Eric, um, you want to check out the video that I did with Jason Fung. It was about in 2016. So if you just type in Jason Fung intermittent fasting, um, I think the thumbnail says something about muscle loss in the thumbnail, fasting and muscle loss. And click on that. He talks a lot about the loose skin and, uh, and fasting. So great question um, from Spinol 1997. Uh, they say, uh, is red meat or poultry better protein source? I think red meat. And so as you all know, or maybe you don't know, we have two pigs, two hogs. We have, gosh, like 16 chickens, three turkeys. Um, what I found, first of all, this is why I like red meat and the cow gods, the lamb gods, they're going to hate me. The elk gods are going to hate me. But first of all, um, you know, the, those type of animals, they're supporting more mass, right? Chickens are very light. You can pick them up with one hand. My daughter who's six can pick up two at a time. They're very small and they are quick. So they're fast twitch. They're moving around. But most of the animals that you all are going to be eating from the grocery store, because probably you're not going to raise backyard chickens and start slaughtering them. If you do, I think that's a better protein source than buying store-bought chicken. Most store-bought chicken, white meat, um, they never see sunlight because they're in an indoor enclosed container. They don't have fresh air. They're staying on concrete. Their microbiomes are crap. So I, I don't think it's a high quality meat. Look, I, I know it's generally white meat is cheaper than say red meat. I think red meat is a higher quality meat. You know, due to the fact that even if you're getting feedlot cattle, um, they have so much mass. Cattle are heavy. So just by that, they have to have a certain amount of like, you know, just basic tonal skeletal muscle to hold them up, right? Um, they have to be able to move around all that weight. So I think it's just better quality protein. I think it's it's darker. It's more enriched in mitochondria. Um that's right. That's just my, my two cents. And personally, like, you know, I've shared this on the channel. We talked with Stan efforting about this, you know, when my bodybuilding friend got me into low carb, high fat dieting back in 2002, you know, one of the things that I switched was getting off the egg whites and getting off a lot of the, um, boneless, skinless chicken breast and getting a lot more red meat in. And back then I would cook it on this, um, George Foreman grill. I mean, it was really unhealthy how I was preparing it, but I noticed that I was able to like maintain more strength, develop lean muscle mass uh, by switching to red meat again. So I'm, I'm sorry, cow gods. I'm sorry, uh, elk gods and venison, uh, sheep, you know, all that. But around here, so in our house, you know, we eat a lot of lamb. I just like the taste of lamb. Uh, and I find that in our area, there is a lot of lamb and generally people don't like lamb. They're used to eating beef or chicken or fish. And so we can get the bone in lamb for very affordable. Um, and it's wild, it's a you know, grass fed and everything like that. Obviously, you know, we do, uh, butcher box provides a great product. So you can get access to that. If you don't have local farmers and things like that, go to butcherbox.com for H I H you get $20 off your first order. So there's a lot of different options, but I strongly suggest getting to know a local farmer, just getting something in your area. So it's not being shipped around and you know, it's fresh. Hopefully you know how they're treating the animals that they're getting sunlight I mean, that's the thing with cattle is they're so big, so heavy. They have a lot of gas that they, they fart a lot with methane and everything. They need to be outside. So at least they're seeing sunlight. They may be eating Skittles. They may be eating soy and corn, but at least they're outside. The chickens are eating all that crap. Plus they're inside. They never see sunlight. And by the way, chickens love the sun. When it's sunny here in Seattle, my chickens are always in the sun, like just sunbathing. They call them dust bathing. So my two cents guys on, uh, what's better chicken or beef. Uh, someone said red meat. A bunch of people are talking about that. Um, so keto mama says clean the house. Is my house dirty? Maybe. Um, so yeah, the, you guys have so many great questions. Everyone's like, are you guys digging the metabolic Mondays? Um, let's see. Fasting mimicry diet is for people. Uh, there are some swear words there. So I uh, really, really appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, and then, like I said, you know, one of the best natural tools that can help to kind of kickstart your fast is exercise, so kind of depleting that glycogen. Check out the interview we did with Ben Bickman. Also, 
Berberine hydrochloride. Again, we're not treating, curing, preventing any diseases here. We're just helping to improve your health. Berberine hydrochloride, we have a new product. It's berberine hydrochloride, the form that is the most efficacious, also with alpha lipoic acid. And it's kind of in the B5, B vitamin family. And, and those two path, those two kind of the mechanisms by which those two natural products work is by stimulating the so-called AMPK pathway that is synergistic with stimulating ketosis and also stimulating uh, autophagy. And as a listener of this channel, as a subscriber, you can save 20% by going to myoscience.com. That's myoscience with an X, M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. We also have all these products on Amazon as well. Use the promo code HRH and save 20% off your next order. And with that, friends, we're going to part ways. Thank you so much for tuning in. Sorry if I didn't get to your questions. There was a lot of questions, a lot of comments. I'm always grateful that you're here. If you're listening right now and you like this style video, please hit that like button. You can always share this with a friend or family member, someone that may benefit if they like the science. And if we're not yet connected on Instagram, dude, let's get connected. Send me a DM over on Instagram, metabolic underscore Mike. Say, Mike, I just tuned into the live stream. What's happening? I always reply to the to the DMs, uh, like connected with you, like to know what you think is important. And I uh, hope you have a great day. Got some new podcasts coming to you later on this week. I'm going to sign off, guys and gals. Thanks for being here. We'll catch you on the next live stream. Peace.